in our headlines on this Thursday, October 17th here on the Korean Peninsula. North Korea amends its constitution to define South Korea as a hostile state according to its state media, which also included reports of the regime's recent detonation of its land links to South Korea. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says his intelligence authorities have proof of North Korean troops taking part in training to join Russia's military offensive against his country. Back here on the local front, Korea's auto exports rose 4.9% on year in September to hit a high of 5.5 billion US dollars, driven by demand for its eco friendly vehicles. We start yet again here on the peninsula where North Korea state media reports that South Korea has been designated a hostile state by the Kim Jong un regime. Our defense correspondent Kim Bo Gyeong has the latest. North Korean state media for the first time publicly mentioned that it defines South Korea as a hostile state in the constitution. In a report on the North state-run Korean Central News Agency on Thursday, the regime said it was, quote, an inevitable and legitimate measure stemming from the serious security circumstances mounting to the unpredictable brink of war due to grave political and military provocations of the hostile forces. The regime previously convened a key parliamentary meeting, the Supreme People's Assembly, earlier on October 7th and 8th. It was widely thought that the North could have made constitutional changes defining inter-Korean relations, as Pyongyang had declared its intention to redefine Seoul as a hostile state last year, along with Kim's order to remove references to peaceful unification. But none related to the issue have been disclosed until Thursday's news report. The report did not mention further details, though, other than mentioning how the Constitution defined the South as a hostile state. South Korean Unification Ministry sources called North Korea's move on anti-unification and anti-national action. But it also said there is a small possibility of the regime not having made the actual amendment, as the regime statement used ambiguous words such as in meeting the demand of the Constitution. The ministry also said it needs to monitor whether there were constitutional changes on territory, especially over the possibility of the regime declaring a new maritime border in the constitution. As Kim Jong-un previously said, the regime cannot accept the northern limit line, the de facto maritime border between the two Koreas. Also on Thursday, KCNA reported on the North having detonated the last symbol of inter-Korean reconciliation, the Gyeonggi and Donghae Line roads. It said the explosions carried out by the Korean People's Army have completely blocked parts of the road and railway along the east coast and parts in Gaesong in the west. While saying such a move was to completely separate the sovereign territory of the north and the south, the North Defense Ministry spokesperson said the regime's actions to permanently fortify its southern border will continue. To this, South Korea's defense ministry said it is monitoring if the regime makes any such moves. We are continuously monitoring and assessing the fortification activities that North Korea claims to be conducting. Kim bo Arirang News. Meanwhile, senior diplomats of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan have condemned North Korea's continued violations of U.N. Security Council resolutions. The condemnation was carried in a joint statement following a meeting here in Seoul earlier on Wednesday among First Vice Foreign Minister Kim Hong-gyun and his American and Japanese counterparts Kurt Campbell and o Masataka Okano respectively. The three officials also pledged trilateral efforts to tackling military collaboration between North Korea and Russia, as well as illicit cyber activities by the Kim Jong-un regime and his dispatch of North Korean workers overseas for funds to support his hostile weapons ambitions. The talks also addressed the rampant violations of human rights in North Korea while calling for the release of abductees, detainees and prisoners of war. In Belgium on this Thursday, four Indo-Pacific nations, including South Korea, are taking part in the NATO Defense Ministers' meeting for the first time. Vice Defense Minister Kim Son ho is attending the two-day gathering in Brussels starting today, with senior officials from 32 nations addressing ways to support Ukraine 
and to strengthen cooperation with the four Indo-Pacific partners, namely South Korea, Australia, Japan and New Zealand. Now, this is the first ministerial meeting of the Security Alliance since new NATO chief Mark Rutte took office earlier this month. Ukraine says thousands of North Korean troops are currently training in Russia for deployment to border areas. South Korea, for its part, is responding with much concern to these latest events. Our correspondent Kim jong shil reports. South Korea announced Thursday that it is carefully tracking reports of North Korean troop deployments to Russia. If the reports are true, it means the North is not only trading arms with Russia, but also directly participating in the war. Our government considers this a very serious issue. The government underscored that such actions would fall under international scrutiny and sanctions, calling once again for a halt to the illicit military cooperation between Moscow and Pyongyang. The response from the government came as Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky repeated his recent claims that North Korea is now sending military personnel to help Russia's war effort as well as transferring weapons. Experts in South Korea say Pyongyang likely would have sent the troops based on the recent comprehensive strategic partnership treaty between Russia and North Korea that states military coordination in the case of foreign attacks. I think the claims made by the president of Ukraine is credible. It is likely that Pyongyang will gradually escalate the intensity of its troop deployment to Russia in line with this agreement. Russia's foreign ministry was quick to dismiss the allegations, calling them irrelevant. North Korea and, and, and Russia, are both countries are denying this, but there seems to be a rather strong evidence. So recent development uh, suggests that, that North Korea-Russia uh, mm. relations are, are morphing into a de facto military alliance. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden is visiting Germany on Thursday to discuss continued support for Ukraine. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. The foreign ministry here has voiced disappointment in response to reports of a ritual offering by Japanese Prime Minister Shigeru Ishiba to the Yasukuni Shrine in Tokyo, where Class A war criminals are honored. In a statement on this Thursday, the ministry called on Tokyo to face its history by taking responsible action. According to Japanese media, Ishiba's offering came in celebration of the Shrine's Falls Festival and is his first offering since entering office at the start of this month. On the political frontier, the results of Wednesday's by-elections are out, including for the post of Superintendent for Education here in Capital Seoul. Our correspondent Yi Shi Hu has details. As expected, the results of Wednesday's by-elections for an education superintendent and heads of local governments followed the country's regional political divides. In what was the first voting since April's general election, the ruling People Power Party won two seats, one of which was in the traditionally conservative city of Busan, while the main opposition Democratic Party won two seats in the traditionally liberal province of Cheollanamdo and the liberal bloc won in Seoul. The PPP's Yoon Hyun won in Gyeongju district in Busan and Park Yong-chol won in Gangwon County in the city of Incheon. The DP won in two counties in Cheollanamdo province, Changseil in Yeonggwangun and Joseongne in Gokseonggun counties. The Liberal superintendent candidate Cheong Geun-sik took the majority in the capital. The final turnout for Seoul was 23.5 percent, while for the four districts and counties combined, it was 53.9 percent. In these by-elections, the strength and ability of the rival party's new leaderships were put to the test. During the campaigns, PPP Chairman Han dong and DP Chairman Lee Jae-myung put in special efforts to support their respective candidates, traveling often to the contested areas. With both parties safely securing seats in the expected regions, Han and Lee both remarked they will move forward with the support people have given them. 
Han said the people have given the PPP and the government a chance to change and renovate, and so that they will work hard to achieve such change, while Yi said they will respect the public sentiment and prevent the government from moving backward and also lead in safeguarding the lives of the people. The election winners will take their post immediately and serve the remainder of the term through June 2026. Yi Shihu, Arirang News. And in other news, Korea's auto exports rose almost 5% on year in September, driven by global demand for eco-friendly vehicles. Our correspondent Lee Soo-jin has more. South Korea's auto exports reached a new monthly high in September. Data released by the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy on Thursday showed that the value of car exports stood at 5.5 billion U.S. dollars, surpassing the previous record of 5.2 billion dollars set in September last year. This is also up 4.9 percent compared to September the previous year. The cumulative export value from January to September came to 52.9 billion dollars, up 1.6 percent year on year, also record high for that period. The ministry said robust exports were mostly driven by high demand for eco-friendly vehicles and a recovering outbound shipments from GM Korea, the country's third largest automaker. The export value of eco-friendly vehicles rose 12.3 percent year-on-year to nearly $2 billion last month, recording a turnaround for the first time in four months. This was led by the value of outbound shipments of hybrid models such as Hyundai Motor Santa Fe and Tucson as well as Kia's Carnival surging more than 75 percent. And the export volume of GM Korea was also up 8.5 percent and 130 percent month-on-month, with more than 35,000 vehicles shipped last month. Domestic production levels were also up 1.7 percent compared to a year earlier, with over 307,000 cars manufactured last month. While there was one less working day compared to September last year, monthly production levels were able to recover to the 300,000 range for the first time in three months thanks to the high overseas demand. And while overall domestic sales fell 2.3 percent compared to the previous year, the high demand for eco-friendly vehicles was also seen in Korea as well. Sales of hybrid vehicles were especially noteworthy, with 46,000 sold, which is up by around 60 percent year-on-year, surpassing the previous high of 41,000 in December last year. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. Also on the local front, Korea's acceptance into the World Government Bond Index starting November next year is fueling much anticipation over the potential inflow of foreign funds into the local bond market. Our correspondent Moon hye files this report. The inclusion of South Korea's sovereign bonds in the world's largest bond index is expected to bring a number of positive economic effects. FTSE Russell announced last week that the country would officially join the ranks of its benchmark World Government Bond Index starting November 2025, after being placed on its watch list since 2022. South Korea met the WGBI strict criteria for market quality, liquidity and accessibility through reforms like extended foreign exchange trading hours and simplified foreign investor registration. Following the announcement, President Yoon Sagal spoke of its major economic implications. 이번 세계 국채 지수 편입으로 약 75조 원의 글로벌 투자 자금이 유입될 것으로 전망됩니다. 75 trillion won, around 55 billion US dollars, comes from taking South Korea's 2.2% portion of the index that is linked to roughly 2.5 trillion dollars of total capital. The index is closely watched by major institutional investors, and once a country's bonds are included, these investors are likely to buy them to ensure their portfolios match the index. The influx of global investment is also expected to affect interest rates. Interest rates are expected to stabilize, reducing funding costs for people and businesses. Higher demand for bonds lowers yields as investors accept lower returns for stability. The Korea Institute of Finance expects WGBI inclusion to reduce government bond rates by 0.2 to 0.6 percentage points, making corporate bonds more attractive and lowering company funding costs. Analysts also predict greater stability in the foreign exchange market. Korean currency markets, the won exchange rate, tend to be volatile in part because the Korean won dollar market is so small. This means that any large transactions can make the market volatile, so a larger market with more debt could stabilize the one's exchange rates. 
Going forward, the government announced that it would be resuming short selling in March next year, as it was reported that FTSE Russell postponed its decision in line with this move. A ban on short selling went into effect last November, and Toll has since been testing a new monitoring system to detect illegal short selling. Moon Hyeryeon, Arirang News. On the K-pop front, much to the delight of fans worldwide, BTS member J-Hope was discharged from military duty earlier on this Thursday after 18 months of service. Our uni has more. J-Hope is back. The main dancer of global K-pop sensation, BTS, has now completed his 18-month mandatory military service and was discharged on Thursday morning. Thank you so much. I come back in good health. And I'm truly grateful. I couldn't have completed my military service well without the support of all of you, my fans. He is now the second of the seven members to reunite with the band's devoted fans, the so-called ARMY. Fans weren't the only ones eagerly awaiting J-Hope being discharged. Fellow BTS member Jin, dressed in a red suit, was also there to welcome him back. Jin was the first to complete his military service, finishing in June. All seven are set to reunite in June 2025, after they've all completed their military service. There were no special events as the group's agency, Big Hit Music, had asked fans to refrain from visiting the site for safety reasons. However, in the afternoon, J-Hope went live on Weverse, a fan community platform, to express his excitement about starting Chapter 3 of his life, thanking fans for their support during his service. Regarding his future plans, he promised to provide further updates once the details are finalized. The superstar, who took a break as Sergeant Jung Woo-seok, is now ready to take off the beret and uniform and step back into the spotlight as BTS's J-Hope. Lee Eun-hee, Arirang News. Meanwhile, over in Argentina, former One Direction singer Liam Payne died from, quote, extremely serious injuries after falling from a hotel balcony in Buenos Aires on Wednesday. According to authorities there, the 31-year-old was pronounced dead at the scene. Now, prior to the fatal fall, police officers had received reports of a guest overwhelmed with drugs and alcohol who was, quote, tearing his room apart. The circumstances of his death have yet to be clarified. Payne is survived by a seven-year-old son and other family members. A Korean institute largely assigned with the task of teaching Hangul is seeking to better respond to the global demand for the Korean language and more. My colleague Han Daun covers its efforts. A foreign participant speaks flawless Korean at a Korean language speaking competition in the United Arab Emirates. The contestants are people from various walks of life who learned how to speak Korean at the King Sejong Institute's language centers. A new center has recently opened at a university in Sharjah, a city known as the cultural capital of the Arab world. Uh, major is international relations. So firstly, I believe that learning Korean language will open doors and uh, bring opportunity to work. But it's quite challenging to learn Korean in regions that lack access to King's Hejong Institute centers. I studied Korean for a year and a half at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, but was unable to continue learning since there aren't many specialized Korean language academies in Macau. Even in regions where Sejong language centers are available, thousands are on waiting lists. To address the growing global demand, the government plans to expand the number of King Sejong Institute centers worldwide to 300 and establish additional branches to support the expansion. It also plans to introduce AI-based Korean language instructors for those who are unable to access offline classes. We will seek various research and development projects to utilize AI teachers in Korean education over the next three years. We plan to provide digital support tailored to the needs of each learner. The government also vowed to earmark an additional budget to help the King Sejong Institute Foundation become a key hub for the promotion of the Korean language, culture, and more. Han Daun, Arirang News.
This is The World Now, bringing you the latest stories from around the globe. A fuel tanker overturned and exploded on Tuesday evening in northern Nigeria's Jigawa state, killing at least 147 people and injuring another 70. A local police spokesperson said that the tanker somersaulted after the driver lost control and spilled fuel into a drainage ditch and that the explosion took place as village residents rushed to collect the fuel. The official added that a mass burial was held on Wednesday afternoon for the victims. Although fuel tanker accidents are not uncommon in Africa's most populous nation, where oil is frequently transported by road, Tuesday's blast was one of the worst in recent times. According to Nigeria's Road Safety Agency, there were over 1,500 fuel tanker accidents recorded in 2020, with more than 500 deaths. Tech billionaire Elon Musk has stepped up efforts to help return Donald Trump to the White House with donations of around 75 million U.S. dollars in just three months to his own political action committee in support of the former president. According to Federal Election Commission filings on Tuesday, Elon Musk's America PAC has already spent some $72 million from July to September to support Donald Trump's re-election bid. The world's richest man endorsed Trump in July before making an appearance at a rally in Pennsylvania earlier this month. The Tesla and SpaceX CEO, who also owns X, reportedly also plays an active role in campaign strategy and speaks several times a week with the former president. Now to India where workers at a Samsung electronics factory ended a month-long strike on Tuesday. The strike at the plant in the southern state of Tamil Nadu, which produces TVs, refrigerators and washing machines, was one of the country's biggest labor disputes in recent years, casting doubts on Prime Minister Narendra Modi's efforts to lure global companies to India. About 1,000 of the factory's 1,800 employees have been protesting since September 9th, demanding higher wages. According to the Center of Indian Trade Unions, Samsung workers on average earn 300 US dollars a month but are seeking an increase to 430 dollars. While the terms of the settlement are unknown, Samsung has said that the average salary of full-time workers at its India factory is almost double what similar workers in the region receive. American lingerie brand Victoria's Secret returned with its iconic fashion show on Tuesday after a six-year hiatus, announcing an inclusive and women-led event. Top models including Gigi and Bella Hadid, Tyra Banks and Adriana Lima returned to the runway for this year's show, while the evening featured performances by Lisa from K-pop group Blackpink and 78-year-old singer Cher. British model Kate Moss, who turned 50 in January, made her Victoria's Secret runway debut, alongside other older and plus-sized models. The show was cancelled in 2019 due to low ratings and criticisms of the brand's lack of diversity and links to controversial individuals. Kim Xiong, Arirang News. The highest daytime temperature in Seoul today was 26 degrees Celsius, which is 6 degrees higher than it was at this stage last year. But the weather will get chilly as it rains. It will be 20 degrees in Seoul tomorrow daytime, which will be 6 degrees lower than today. It will start raining in Jeju tonight, and it will gradually expand to the southern part of the country tomorrow morning and the central parts of the country in the afternoon. This rain will continue until Saturday. The expected amount of rainfall will be up to 100 millimeters on the east coast of Gangwon-do province, up to 80 in the other central and southern coastal areas, and up to 60 in the southern parts of the country. Tomorrow morning, Seoul, Daejeon, and Daegu will start off at 16 degrees. Highs will move up to 19 in Chuncheon, Gwangju, and Gyeongju, 24 degrees. On Sunday, morning temperatures in Seoul will hit the single digits, bringing the coldest weather this fall. That's all for Korea. Here are the weather conditions around the world.
Right, those are the headlines at the SAR here in South Korea. Coming up now is our daily panel session with members of the press and pundits. And today we talk about Korea's inclusion to the World Government Bond Index.